Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, the differences between Japanese and Chinese green tea. In this video, I'm going to be giving you an overview of the differences between these two titans of green tea production, and then we're going to be doing a taste test to see if we can sensorially describe the differences in the cup. This video is going to go onto the basic tea educations playlist. If at any point in time you enjoy this video, make sure you hit it with the thumbs up. The more thumbs in the air, the more tea videos are going to come your way. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, what are you waiting for? Go click that button. This is probably one of the most requested videos that we have at the moment. The differences between China and Japan in terms of tea and specifically green tea. Before we get stuck in, couple of disclaimers. The first one is that this is not a competition. I'm not trying to prop up one country or put down another country. Both produce exemplary green teas and both can produce poor quality teas too. The second disclaimer here is that I'm going to be giving you an overall view, a snapshot, and that means that there will be some generalizations. There are thousands of teas and thousands of producers out there and some of them will not fit neatly in these rules. So please don't start writing in the comments, well, what about this tea from this particular area? I recognize that the generalizations here are generalizations, but they're there to give you an overall idea of the main differences between these two countries. I have before me two teas. I've got Kanaya Midori Sencha here, one of the most famous and probably the most widely consumed tea in Japan. And I've got Bilochen or green coil, which again is a classic Chinese tea. So I picked these two teas because they are both very, very classic teas for their country. They're around the same price range. They, there are many, many different grades. Like all tea, there are many different grades. This, because they're May leaf teas, are obviously going to be top echelon tea. So this is a top draw Sencha and a top draw Bilochen. They're both 2017 teas. Green teas you should drink within two years of production. So I'm speaking to you from May 2018. So these are about a year old. So they've got a good nine, 10 months in them before you will start to notice any significant deterioration in flavor. We are currently in crazy spring tea buying mode, but I'm very much of the opinion that I don't want to jump too quickly and just pick the earliest spring tea samples that I get. I want to taste through all of the samples and select the best quality leaves because I only get one shot to purchase for spring tea because it's got to last me the whole year round. So I want to make sure I pick the absolute best leaves. So we don't jump too quickly. These are 2017 teas. They are still immaculate. If you happen to be watching on the weekend that this video is being released, so the weekend of the 26th of May 2018, we are currently having a sale on on mayleaf.com, a sale covering many different types of tea, a lot of green teas in the run up to us switching over to 2018 harvest. But as I said, these are all immaculate as they are. Both of these teas are in the sale. Okay, let's move straight into the main differences between Japan and China. Let's start with quantity. The quantity is very, very significant. So Japan produces something in the region of about 90 to 100 million kilograms of tea per year. Sounds like a lot, but it dwarfs in comparison to China. China in 2016, 2017 produced about 2,400 million kilograms of tea in a year. So that gives you a clear image. And of the 95 million kilograms in Japan, 72 million, so that's nearly 75, 80% of their tea was green tea. So you can see how the emphasis is on green tea. The vast majority of tea produced in Japan is green tea. I did not manage to get the stats on how much of that 2,400 million kilos of Chinese tea uh, is green tea or was green tea. I do believe, I think it is definitely the case that green tea still is the most produced tea type. I'm going to estimate that it would be something like a third. So let's take an estimate and it is just a wild guess of around 800 to 900 million kilograms of green tea being produced. I would certainly say that it's in the order of about eight to 10 times the amount compared to Japan. So that's the first difference, quantity. The second difference here is the production style. In Japan, it's much more industrialized. Now, 
don't get freaked out by that word. I just mean that the T is put through a process of conveyor belts more. There's less handmade T compared to China. So China has a real culture of handmade tea. Um, of course, there's conveyor belt tea made in China. Of course, there is industrially produced commodity tea made in China. But the culture of Chinese tea in general is much more handmade compared with Japan, which focuses much more on a conveyor belt kind of style system where the tea goes through a very exacting process, which is all computer controlled. The third difference is really a spin-off of that, is that because of that, Japanese tea production tends to be more standardized. There, there, there tends to be less variation compared with China. Again, there are positives and negatives to that. We'll talk about that in a second. So the three main differences, quantity much higher in China compared to Japan. The second is, uh, handmade versus more kind of exacting computer controlled uh, processing of tea and the last is the variation in China compared to more standardization in Japan and so therefore you have um, some general uh, I think truths about Japanese versus Chinese uh, green tea and that is that Japanese green tea is much more consistent the quality of Japanese tea is much more consistent. Um, however, the variation in Japanese green tea is lower. So you get more variation in Chinese green tea, but you get wildly different gradings, wildly different uh, um, qualities, um, and so the consistency is not there. In terms of commodity tea, both countries produce commodity tea. However, just by looking at the percentages. Let's assume that the percentages are the same. So let's say that 50% of tea made in both countries ends up to be commodity tea. Obviously, China is gonna be producing a lot more commodity tea simply because it is producing more tea. So you, will, you are more likely to find commodity or low quality, low grade tea from China than you are from Japan. The flip side of that is you're also more likely to find really interesting rarefied green teas from China than you are Japan. So there's, there's pros and cons for both approaches. Right, let's move on now to the teas themselves. Let me show you these teas close up. In fact, let me put both of them next to each other so you can start to visually see the differences between these two leaves. Let's quickly scope it. These are both the season of both of these are spring. However, in Japan, the spring harvest tends to be later than in China. That's one of the differences. It's not just, my suspicion is it's not just about the difference in climate, but it's also what they're trying to get out of the tea. The spring harvest here is later because they want the leaves to be slightly larger. You can see that these are larger picked leaves. Ooh, don't drop any that these are larger pick leaves compared to this very fine picking, so they want them to be larger. Also, during this growing process, the Japanese uh, mentality is a little bit more about manipulating the flavor of the tea whilst it is growing, and we'll talk about that in a second. Cultivars don't really matter because they're very different cultivars. This is a Dongting Kun tea, and this is a Kanaya Midori. Um, the origin, again, doesn't really matter, but I'll go through it. This is from Dongting in China, and this is from Kagoshima. Obviously, terroir makes a big difference in both provinces. Both provinces um, have a, a good idea of the best provinces, to, uh, best areas, and best terroir in their countries to grow their tea. The picking and processing, as you can see, different, larger leaf here versus more fine picking here. This is a bud in one leaf, and this will be um, more like young leaves um, and even kind of medium sized leaves as well. Processing wise, one of the main differences in processing between Japanese and Chinese tea is that Japanese green tea tends to be steamed and Chinese tends to be either air baked or pan baked. This is a pan baked tea and this is a steamed tea. And I need to put these down because I'm getting a cramp. So um, I'll turn it like this so you can see with this camera. This is steamed versus pan baked. That's obviously going to make a big difference in flavor. Elevation, this is 250 to 300 meters compared to 700 meters. Japan is always lower elevation to China. 
and that makes a big difference to how you produce the tea because lower elevation means that you're growing more on flatlands, it means it's getting more direct sun throughout the day, then that means that you need to work on the growing a little bit more, you need to protect those leaves a little bit more. Also, low elevation means more likelihood of insects, so you've got to control that as well. So, that moves us on to the overall differences in the production styles of the tea. And in my opinion, from my visiting of both countries, one of the key differences that I notice is that in Japan, there's more manipulation of the tea during the growing phase. And that starts with the soil. So the soil will always be enriched or well fertilized. Now don't be freaked out by the word fertilizers. It can be organic, natural fertilization, but it's all about putting as much richness in the soil as possible. Also, the manipulation goes um, as far as shading, for example, in Gyokuro or Matcha or in Kabusecha, where they will shade the leaves. So again, manipulation during the growing phase. However, in, Ch in China, there tends to be more of a reliance on the natural terroir um, of the area. So this tea grows well in this area naturally. We're not gonna mess with it too much. We're not gonna manipulate it too much. So that's one of the key differences, I think, is the amount of manipulation during the growing phase. The converse of that is in Japan, once those leaves have been picked, there seems to be more of an emphasis about locking in that flavor, about making it as transparent as possible, which is why I think steaming really suits Japanese tea and why they do steam uh, their tea, is because it's all about building up as much concentration of flavor and the flavor notes that you want for your tea during the growing phase, then after picking, it's about locking it in by sending it through those conveyor belts, a very standardized exacting process, including a very transparent steaming uh, process of heating. And that means that you get these very nice, glossy, green, locked in color leaves. Compare that with China, where there's much more focus on the terroir, on natural growing, leaving the leaves alone a little bit more. But after they've picked, they start to manipulate the flavor. So they'll manipulate the flavor in the case of this tea through the pan baking to add that little bit of warmth, that little bit of heat into the flavor of the tea. And also by rolling each leaf very, very carefully to extract all of those essential oils, they will react with the air in a different way and react differently when you brew. Let's get on with brewing. I'm thirsty. So I'm gonna heat this kettle up to 80 degrees Celsius, that's 175 Fahrenheit. I've decided to brew these teas as I think they should be brewed individually. So I'm not gonna standardize the brewing. I could have done that. I could have brewed them exactly the same way, but I don't think that's fair. It's better to let each tea be brewed as it should be and um, let them both shine. So one of the key differences in brewing between Japanese tea and Chinese tea, the Gongfu style is using smaller containers and a larger leaf to water ratio compared to a larger pot. This Kyushu is 300 mil and in here I have seven grams of the uh, Sencha here. So in general with Japanese brewing, it is a lower leaf to water ratio compared to Chinese brewing. There are many variations on advice regarding Japanese brewing. I tend to uh, kind of do a little hybrid where I, I brew a little bit closer to Chinese style, but not quite as much. But the key here really is why, why is that the case? Why is it that Japanese tea brewing um, is a little bit less water ratio and the brewing times are longer? Well, we talked about it already. The enriching of the leaves during the growing phase, in my opinion, makes Japanese tea much more concentrated in flavor. And therefore you don't need quite as much leaf to water ratio. And because of the fact that the celebration in Japan is much more about umami, and we'll talk about that when we're drinking it, um, and less about uh, the brighter notes of a tea, you just generally can extract those notes out more if you brew longer. Right, I'm gonna warm up this teaware. Place the Kanai Midora Sencha into this Kyusu. This Kyusu is new in, 
can check it out. It's our new cream stone, uh, cream stone Kyusu 300 mil. It's available online if you want to purchase one. Ah, oh, smell. So the predominance with Japanese tea is let's move more towards those savory notes. I'm getting salted toffees. I'm getting sea air. I'm getting vegetable notes. I'm getting spinach. I'm getting um, artichokes. I'm getting a definite saltiness on the nose. Real, real emphasis on the more savory vegetal notes of a tea. And for some people, some, I would say, more Western palates that associate drinks with sweet and anything that's a savory liquid equals soup. Um, sometimes this is a little bit hard to get their head around. For others, they just naturally are drawn to it, but definitely a distinct savory note to that tea, but also creamy. This one here has those savory notes, but much brighter, more floral notes, more fruits involved. And I believe that it's not just about the cultivars and the terroir, but it's also about the mentality, how they want uh, the leaves to taste, and therefore manipulating the leaves during the growing phase, shading it if necessary, um, to bring out more of those savory notes, um, and enriching that soil so that you get this real, real depth of theanine, which is that umami flavor in the leaves, is so paramount to Japanese tea brewing. I'm gonna guess this, I know I'm gonna constantly uh, uh, get criticized online, but I'm gonna guess a minute here. This has been about 20 seconds. You can time me if you want. So a minute on here, 80 degree water, that's 175 Fahrenheit. Um, I think I'm gonna need a couple of Gong Dao Beis to empty this one. And then we're only gonna do about 15 seconds here. So that's one of the key differences, right? Less water to, less leaf to water in J J Japanese brewing, but also longer brewing times. All right. I'm gonna say we're at about a minute. Beautiful color. Because of the fact that in Japan, they really lock in the flavor of the tea as it's picked with that steaming process, you get these really vibrant green colors, much more so than in Chinese tea. Notice I didn't wash that one. I'm gonna give this one a quick rinse, as is Gong Fu style. And then we're gonna do a 15 second brew on it. We're gonna take a look at the difference. Visually, major, major difference in the leaves, and you will see a big difference also in the liquor. Give it a little bit of agitation, okay maybe closer to 20 seconds here. Something like this, okay. Right, take a look at the difference in the color of the liquor and you'll see what I mean about locking in greenness, locking in the flavor from the natural leaf. This one here, much more uh, light, less concentration of flavor, right? So there's less manipulation during the growing phase um, and it produces a lighter liquor. Right, let's give these a taste. Japanese first. Cheers, everybody. Savory notes coming through. Mineral notes coming through. Um, bitterness is, is really understated. The uh, the uh, emphasis, um, in my opinion, on most Japanese tea growers' minds is to build up those savory notes, build up that umami, build up those vegetal notes, and um, not focus too much on those catechins, on those bright notes, on those bitter notes um, as much. Whereas in Chinese tea, much brighter more flowers, more floral, much lighter in taste. Elegant, stony, I get jasmine. I also get vegetal, but it's much more toned down. So I will get some of those spinach notes, a little bit of kind of um, raw vegetable note compared with this one. 
much thicker, more brothy, more umami, more savory. And my experience is that you get a much bigger theanine hit with Japanese teas. You feel that kind of feel good effect of tea because theanine, for those of you who don't know, is the amino acid which contributes mostly to this happy feeling, this uh, sense of well-being, which is continuously being associated with tea drinking. Theanine is protected much more in Japanese tea because of the fact that it's built up through fertilization of the soil, protected with shading, and then locked in through its processing. With Chinese tea, it tastes more natural, if that's okay for me to say. It tastes more like the environment that it's grown in. It tastes like I can taste jasmine, I can taste flowers, I can taste rocks. It tastes more meadowy. So key differences here in the way that the tea is produced demonstrates itself in the taste in the cup. I love both Japanese and Chinese, but I see them very, very separately. If I want something which is going to be very uh, thick, rich, brothy, um, is going to give me this real kind of tingling, kind of feel good, you know, uh, sensation, Japanese green tea is where I would go. If I want something that is more bright, more kind of natural tasting, a little bit more kind of um, of the terroir, a little bit more elegant, I would say, then I will focus on my Chinese green tea. So as I said at the beginning, there is no winner here. They are different. And <clears throat> the flavor of the tea really represents not just the production method, not just the growing method, but almost speaks directly of the differences in the kind of overall culture of China and Japan, with Japanese being um, a little bit more um, focused on a very exacting standardization, a real interest in uh, consistency and quality compared to the more chaotic Chinese culture where the focus is a little bit more on letting nature do its thing and seeing what we can make out of it um, through experiments and variation. And I think that those cultural aspects really reveal themselves in the cup. One last sip. Incredible, incredible teas. Try them both. As I said, if you're watching when this video is released, both of these are on sale so you can do this AB comparison yourself. I hope that this video has answered some of your questions about the differences between China and Japan in terms of tea production. There is a lot more that we could talk about, but this is just a general overview. That's it, tea heads. If you made it to the end of this video, then make sure you hit it with a thumbs up. Check out our YouTube playlist and let us know if there are any videos that you would like us to make. If you're ever in London, then come visit us in Camden to say hi and taste our wares. If you have any questions or comments, then please fire them over. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayley. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags, keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.